we want to make sure that we thank all of our sponsors uh, for supporting this year's virtual conference, uh, especially in light of the fact that they all chose to stay with us, uh, even though uh, we transitioned from a physical to a virtual event. So again, Diamond Level, Warner Media, Gold Level, Kennesaw State University, Coles College, and the KSU Department of Information Systems, Bishop Fox, Coal Fire, uh, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR. Uh, at the crystal level, critical path and synopsis. Uh, at the silver level, errands, binary defense, Black Hills information security, core light and guide point security. At the bronze level, NCC group. A uh, couple of in-kind sponsors. Uh, yesterday we had great training from EC Council. Uh, and uh, also today we've got great, uh, a great relationship working with a Secure Code Warrior for the virtual uh, CTF that they are running over in that track today. Uh, we would also like to thank the following individuals and organizations for contributing to our raffle prize effort. Uh, Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray and Information and Offensive Security, and Pentester Lab. And so get used to hearing that. You will hear that multiple times throughout the day. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, I would like for everybody to welcome Shane Peden, uh, who will be talking, uh, running us through his presentation, uh, Conquering the Cloud, Defense in Depth Strategies for Amazon Web Services. Let me stop sharing my screen here, and then Shane, it will be yours. There you go. Thank you. All right, guys. So um, I'm Shane Peden. Uh, as Andy mentioned, also former Kennesaw State alumni. I went to school with Andy, so we go back a little ways. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, defense in depth for uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, I've got a, a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to minimize Slack or just try to keep it in the corner of the eye of my eye. Otherwise, my, uh, my ADD is going to get the best of me and I'm going to go crazy. So AWS is a, a really interesting topic. And so for this talk, I'm going to keep it kind of maybe, um, maybe just like kind of semi-technical, but not hyper-technical. I know that there's probably some engineers in the, uh, in the session that probably have mega expertise that vastly outweighs my own. So uh, by all means, forgive me if I get anything wrong. And uh, actually, I'll, I'll kick into who I am. And so as I mentioned, um, or I haven't mentioned yet, I am a uh, consultant, like a vet or a keynote speaker, and I've actually worked with a vet on past projects with cross paths. It's a, it's a small world. I'm not an engineer. Um, I did do some development back in the day. I'm a former IT guy from an earlier career, but day to day, I don't turn the gear, so to speak. So why should you listen to anything that I have to say about AWS? Um, I'm usually on the other side, on the audit side. So usually doing a security assessments, audits, scanning, reviewing uh, policies, including even technical policies actually within AWS and configurations. And then I'm also a uh, pen test peer reviewer. I'm uh, pretty, pretty bad at pen testing, but I do a lot of peer review and I'm good at picking things out of them, asking the hard questions and looking at them from the perspective of my client and also as a business owner and a stakeholder. So I read a ton of pen tests and Risk360, my team is fortunate to actually have some amazing pen testers. So I'm constantly also seeing how AWS is getting gamed and seeing where clients are failing and those patterns that emerge over and over. And I'll share some of, the, of those as we go through uh, my defense and depth strategy because it's really largely driven off of really the same three or four issues that we see again and again in pen tests. And uh, I also help clients develop controls. So where our offsec team where I work are always attacking, I'm usually on the other side helping companies figure out how to design their environment, either to meet certain compliance needs, uh, especially PIPA and PCI. You know, you have to think a lot about how you design your AWS environment to meet some of these more stringent industry and regulatory standards. So we're usually thinking from both a compliance perspective and also purely a hardness perspective and avoiding a lot of the pitfalls that you see happen over and over again. And uh, over, you know, the time I've been looking at 
AWS environments, which spans six years and has really ramped up a lot over the last three years. I've been fortunate enough to see everything from the wow, that's awesome to the are you kidding me? So I mean, I, I've seen the whole gamut, probably, probably 60 to 70 different companies at this point over the, the life of my career. Most of them are high growth startups. Um, if you pull out your phone and scroll through the app list, I've probably seen the AWS environment behind at least a few of those apps that you have on your phone. So I'm really, really lucky. Um, as we go through this talk, by all means, like I said, there are Slack messages up there. We'll see it in the end. And I'll give you some context about what we're, we're talking about here, where we see the biggest issues. So the, the vast majority of issues that we see in AWS are related to misconfiguration and poor credential management. And those in turn lead to insider threat a lot more times than often. Um, because AWS is so complex that it's, it's easy to hide back doors in it if you just don't have a well-governed environment and a well-controlled environment. And these, uh, these issues span, the, span companies and organizations of all sizes. In the last two years, uh, even all the way up to U U.S. Department of Defense, uh, there was even a consultant for... Uh, the uh, Republican National Committee, an analytics firm that gave away all of our voting data a few years ago. So that's all out there. You know, Accenture had another large consulting firm. They got hit with poorly managed uh, S3 buckets, which are basically online storage buckets a while back. And uh, according to Gardner, all of this boils down for the most part to poor access management and poor configuration and then somebody taking advantage of that. So how is this really different from what has always been happening? You know, uh, I say security in real life, you know, are, are these really just the same problems that have always existed? Is this just a, another people problem, like, like another IT problem? I'd argue, no, it's actually bigger than IT because the cloud has created a new breed of IT uh, IT professionals that have to have very different skill sets than what we previously saw in last generation's IT personnel. So in the past, you could get away really with having a strong perimeter, a strong firewalled off network. And then from that firewalled off network, you could sometimes get away with having some really good security appliances and security utilities inside that network that were very actively working on your behalf and thwarting a lot of the most common attacks and kind of feel good with having a really insecure environment that is actually somewhat secure and hard to, hard to attack if you're an attacker and when you have these big enterprise grade defenses in place. Web infrastructure is a lot different because it's so scalable, it's so quick to change and it's all just up there and internet connected by nature of what it is, that it's very easy to accidentally open it up to the public world. Um, and you also, I found in my experience, have a lot more people interacting with it, a lot more developer teams, a lot more uh, engineering teams and whatnot. And they're usually doing it programmatically. So you don't usually have like a small team of network engineers that guard these firewalls like, you know, like it's their crown jewels. Instead, you have a lot of different teams setting up different infrastructure across the array of whatever AW assets the company's purchased. And sometimes things got to sync. Sometimes teams aren't following the same change procedures, you know, and, and teams start to grow organically or they get different cultures and some are more locked down than others. So we see it a lot harder to actually lock down the environments and control them. And it's, it's really just due to how fast things move in the cloud. So we're about to start getting into my strategies. Um, I've developed these basically as a starting point. This isn't the end ball be all list of things you should do. These are basically the foundations you need to do to meet both security and compliance requirements. Um, as we go through, all of these could be much, many more layers deeper than what they are. And I've also just tried to keep the conversation and options limited to AWS-centric solutions. There's a lot of third-party solutions that are amazing. 
Uh, but we could talk for days. That could be a, that that's a conference in of itself. You know, uh, it's called Black Hat. You know, I mean, basically everybody's selling their stuff. So as we go through this, think about it as this is a baseline to uh, to make sure that you just have your basics checked off. And then think about ways that you can build upon it from there. So we'll kick into uh, strategy number one, logging. Some, there is a certain amount of logging within AWS that is enabled by default. And uh, AWS's logging solution is called CloudTrail. And basically AWS is driven completely by APIs. So everything is these programmable interfaces and on the back end, it works a lot different than what your typical Windows Active Directory environment used to look like. And AWS is really good about allowing you to suck all that information up. But I've seen some companies that either scaled back their logging or maybe they just weren't enabling it, uh, enabling cloud trails everywhere that they should be and not getting a holistic picture of everything that's happening in the organization. So. The first thing you got to do is enable logging because if you can't recreate history, you can't track down uh, things that are happening in the background. If you can't investigate incidents that have happened in the past, I mean, you're, you have no way of getting to the root cause of what's happening, seeing what's happening to you or detecting it. You're basically flying blind. Another big thing we've seen in pen test is their pre-built modules pre-built pen test modules that are open source, anybody can grab, that are made to attack logs. And what they will do is not necessarily kill logging or disable, it, but they'll go in and try to strategically limit logging or obfuscate them or, or destroy certain logs that may, may be damaging or reveal what they're doing in the environment. So my tip number one is you gotta access log, uh, access rights to logs. And then also making sure that things like logs around S3 buckets, which are your storage, and basically simple storage within AWS, make sure that those logs are also protected and encrypted so that you can't see who's accessing what in the clear. Um, and that's another great point. Logs aren't necessarily encrypted by default. Um, another mistake and challenge we see customers with is not understanding where that shared responsibility matrix between AWS and the company ends and begins. So people might assume, oh, well, it's AWS, it's secure. Well, yes, AWS does a good job of securing the underlying infrastructure, but that doesn't mean they're encrypting all your stuff by default. And that doesn't mean that they're limiting access by default. So you gotta make sure also that you're actually encrypting your logs. And then finally, you gotta make sure that you're retaining them. So you can set lifecycle policies and you can store those logs in S3. But if you don't set them to meet whatever industry requirements or regulatory requirements you're beholden to, you might get yourself in trouble. You just shouldn't assume that it's happening. You shouldn't assume that, oh, well, if I ever have an incident, AWS is taking care of me and I'm just gonna go grab them all. A really good example is a uh, HIPAA, it has a seven year retention on anything related to healthcare processing and transactions that are happening. So if you're a company that's touching PHI, a lot of companies, you know, the compliance people know this stuff, but maybe the technical people don't, and maybe that business requirement never got fed down to them. And they're like, well, heck, we have to store app logs, you know, cloud trust for seven years. Nobody ever told me that. You know, the default is nowhere near seven years. You know, maybe they, or maybe we had a policy that was just getting rid of them so that we're just not incurring these extra costs of retaining these logs indefinitely or for an extended period of time. You got to have those conversations and figure that out. And then another gotcha I found that is worth noting is centrally managing those logs. Uh, as you start scaling up your AWS infrastructure, teams will start distributing their infrastructure across what are called availability zones. This allows you to basically have one set of AWS infrastructure, say on the West Coast and another on the East Coast, and it helps you achieve certain availability objectives or business continuity objectives, or maybe some failover objectives. If you're not centrally logging and pulling all your logs together, you're gonna start having divisions of truth. 
And it's gonna get really hard to do effective investigations or tracking, or if you're feeding those logs into something like um, another AWS tool, CloudWatch, which can ingest AWS logs and visualize them for you and do automated alerting on them and all that, you got to get them all together in the same place. So that's another thing I've seen some teams get tripped up on. So after you've dealt with your logs, next good step is to uh, start locking down the console. So in AWS, there's different ways of accessing your environment. You can log into the console, which is basically go to the website, log in with your credentials and just start pointing and clicking. This is probably what's comfortable to your more traditional IT employee that's used to working in Active Directory. Um, I know Active Directory has moved a lot more towards PowerShell and a lot more of that is command driven more and more all the time. But traditionally, back when I worked in IT, it was all GUI. It was all front end pointing and clicking. AWS will give you that same capability to an extent in the console. But then outside of that console, a lot of other people are interacting with it through uh, software development kits and API access. And that's where I see the majority, pretty much everybody working in it that's really AWS savvy. So that means the console almost becomes a security liability. Everybody's going over the command line to get to AWS and this root access in the console kind of gets neglected and forgotten every now and then. So after you, you know, get your logging in place, you've got AWS set up. My next big one is now lock down that console access and don't let anybody have access to it that doesn't need it. Usually that's going to be limited to like some site reliability engineering guys and maybe maybe a high level executive in the company like the CTO, somebody like that. And then you also got to put MFA, multi-factor authentication on it. MFA is actually also a compliance requirement now for a lot of the, uh, the popular standards that you see out there. It actually, like PCI explicitly says, hey, all admin camp console access, you got to have MFA on it. So in addition to just being smart, it's probably also a compliance requirement for your company if you're dealing with most any kind of sensitive data at all. Um, I'd also say after you put MFA, make sure that password's strong, and then go into your user uh, AWS IAM, Identity Access Management uh, Console, and start really paring down all those permissions to anybody that has that console access. And also, Make sure that you're not letting people that have console access also have programmatic access on the same account. It's, it's really a big no-no just to allow people to both hit it on the command line and also be able to interactively log in with the same account. Uh, I see teams consistently allow this to happen and I, I, it comes up over and over again that everybody's like, no, no, you need to, you need to have those segregation of duties just so that we can really lock down how people are accessing this. If one account is compromised, you don't automatically get access to the other. The other uh, good tip I have, root account. Nobody should really be interacting programmatically with your environment as root. You need to be as an identifiable user in identity access management. So delete those API keys. Just let the root log in as root when you need it. And that's kind of a break glass situation when you should be logging in as the root account anyway. And don't let root do anything but actually hit that admin account. And I've seen some companies go as far as printing up those root accounts, the credentials, and putting them in a fire safe. And then also putting them in like a, a cryptographic key management system, like a hardware security module something like that, and then just not letting anybody use root ever. Nobody actually knows the password unless they need to go get it for some reason. And then also, going back to strategy number one, make sure that crowd, uh, CloudTrail logging is enabled, especially on anything the root account is doing. And I've seen some teams set up high, automatically flag high-risk alerts if root does anything. If root touches anything at all, that's an instant, in, uh, that's an instant security incident in their mind, and it gets elevated to the top of the queue, and it's seen as almost like a breach because nobody should have root. 
So strategy number three, this is a tough one. Develop an IAM management strategy. Um, this is this has always been hard everywhere. Even back in the days of uh, Active Directory, well, I guess Active Directory is still a thing. I just see less of it personally, but even in Active Directory, it's really hard to manage access because in large organizations, it gets unwieldy fast. And identity access management, I feel it's also a little bit tough to manage because everything is so programmatically driven. Like when you want to, when you want to issue new permissions, usually those are taking form as a, like Java, JavaScript object notation. Like you're, you're programmatically setting up permissions and shooting it to AWS and you're provisioning permissions that way. And it gets really hard sometimes for somebody that doesn't have console access and they're just working programmatically to really tell what they're giving permission to what and what the consequences of that are. It also gets hard because within AIM, there, there are hundreds of pre-built permissions that you can choose from, and they all do very different things. So coming up with a good, coming up with a good IAM strategy first starts with policies. And that's really uncool to a lot of security people, but it, it requires stepping back as a management team and saying who needs permission to do what? What is our environment comprised of? And what groups do, do, do we need to, uh, to use to get this done? So once you uh, get those basic policies down, you gotta start mapping different roles or users to uh, user groups. And the goal should be to really make that as least privileged as possible. That can get hard sometimes though. Uh, it can get hard for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's just hard to tell what groups have the ability to do what. And then uh, number four, you could take a uh, least privilege approach and start using AWS security token services. So, Think of it this way, you could create your baseline of AWS roles, what they need to have permission to, and then you could create a situation where users actually have to use this thing called AWS STS, security token service, to dynamically be given access and assume those roles, and then the access automatically, uh, automatically expires after a short time. So let me go over to the next slide real quick. So best in class companies I've seen spend a lot of time on AWS IAM. They uh, use it as a foundation of their, uh, their program, their information security program. Usually IAM serves as a launching point into other solutions. Some of the best uh, solutions I've seen is people will have either Active Directory or G Suite and they'll integrate that with Okta or OneLogin. These are single sign-on products. And uh, they'll, they'll basically let Okta and OneLogin stand as an authentication engine between more of an enterprise solution that your, your HR and enterprise IT teams would uh, interact with. And you'll manage user identities based on, you know, if they actually work here at a minimum, you know, whether they actually have a legitimate account between their G Suite or their Gmail address, their enterprise address or the, uh, the Microsoft account, that'll integrate with Okta or one login. And then those will integrate with AWS and you can actually tie users together between what they should have permission with in AWS, tie that IAM back to your, uh, your basically your G Suite and AD, uh, user access management permissions. Then Okta and one login give you the ability to uh, layer multi-factor authentication on top of it. So you can actually layer on that extra layer of security. And then you could even go a, uh, a step further. I've seen some teams also use AWS security token services, which are those temporary credentials that are dynamically generated. And in short, the way it works is a user will use their Active Directory or GC credentials to more or less authenticate to AWS. They'll be pre-assigned roles with an IAM that the team has, the management team has already developed and created a baseline for an AWS. 
And then those users will make a request or AWS IAM will make a request for a temporary security token. And it'll give you that token. You'll assume that role and be given permission for a short period of time. You do whatever administrative features you need to do in the environment. And then the permissions expire. This uh, alleviates one of the big problems that we see in pen test where users also will be given IAM permissions that have a uh, security key attached to it. And that key allows them to programmatically access the environment, usually over SSH, which is a, a remote access protocol. So using the security token services, it gives you automatic key rotation and it keeps people from having that persistent access. And then the integration with the enterprise security side of the house gives you the extra benefit of tying back your IAM users, whether they should be legitimately given access back to the HR function of the business, which is usually working with enterprise security to make, to provision those email accounts more or less at the time that the, uh, the employee is hired. So IAM, huge deal. We could do a whole talk on that. And uh, I, Actually, if you guys have any uh, questions on that in particular, dump those in Slack because I have a lot of thoughts on IAM and what I've seen teams do good and bad on that one. So we touched on this a little bit. Oh, sorry. But after IAM, the next big one is dealing with those access keys. So when users interact with AWS, they're usually doing so over a command line, like I'd mentioned. And the way that you authenticate is over an access key. Well, one problem that we've seen with a lot of uh, teams is they're given an access key and they never rotate them and they never expire. This is for a number of reasons. And it's usually not because of laziness. It's actually usually because it's really hard to manage access key rotation in AWS, depending on how you're architecting your solution. So for example, when you're interacting with um, AWS's EC2 instances, which is basically their basic virtual machine unit that you can stand up infrastructure in AWS, a lot of times it's not easy to communicate those key rotations to the EC2 instances. It can also be a challenge in uh, databases as well. So every time you rotate a key, everywhere that the, uh, the other half of that key the public part of that key is shared, you would have to rotate it there as well. Because it would be akin to me saying, uh, say you show up to a cool nightclub and the club has a, a password to get in. Well, you change a password and you never told the other guy on the other side of the door that the password changed. How do you communicate that? What's an effective way to do that, especially in a very complex network of infrastructure? So, and pen tests it becomes a problem because usually developers and engineers will have those keys sitting on the laptop, or maybe they were accidentally committed to source code somewhere, or they're leaked online, or they're stolen one way or the other. And bad guys get a hold of these and they exploit them. And if they're never rotating or expiring, you got persistently, you know, usable passwords essentially floating out in the internet that anybody from anywhere might be able to get into the environment if you don't have other safeguards in place. So AWS offers a few solutions for this. And uh, one of them are Lambda features. So Lambda, Lambda is another talk, but in short, it's, it's a, a serverless infrastructure that you can just throw functions at and AWS manages all the infrastructure and processing behind it. So AWS is, has templates that will help you with managing key rotation especially for databases. So I'd encourage you to Google that if you guys are dealing with this in your company. Um, and then the STS that I mentioned uh, in the last slide, that's another great way to get automated rotation of keys. So again, I always come back to that. If you guys can use those, uh, those rotating temporary STS tokens, definitely go for it. Another gotcha here that I'd already mentioned, make sure that you have policies and procedures against putting your access keys in the config files of the applications, within web configs, source code, all of that, because it, it just leads to a whole world of pain. And we see it time and time again in pen tests. Um, another strategy, 
different access keys for different applications. But again, this creates more burden and complexity in the environment, but it's, it is a, a strategy I've seen some teams take. In uh, web applications, so layered defense model for web apps. One thing that I've learned about uh, all the uh, organizations I've worked with is organizations never build the same app twice, or they never build it the same way as, as one of their peers in the organization. But a lot of them are using, using very similar components on the back end. That being your S3 buckets, ELB, web app firewall, availability zones, et cetera. So as you're thinking about how you're stacking together the AWS elements that you use to build your app, you gotta start thinking about how you, how you are building security into the design. So first things first, you gotta identify and define all the business needs. This, this kind of exists outside of security. You've got to think, what does this app actually have to do? And then as you're designing the app, you've got to tie that back to security requirements. And then those security requirements ultimately become technical requirements. So once we have those technical requirements, start thinking about, okay, what ports do we actually need to have available to us? What kind of communication does the app actually need to have available to it to, uh, to basically create this this least privileged situation where apps are only allowed to talk to each other based on a need to know basis. So in uh, AWS, you have the concept of virtual private clouds and then also security groups. Virtual private clouds create virtualized private networks within AWS. And then within those, you can actually have subnets. And this starts to look a little bit more conceptually like your traditional IT environment, where you might have like a dematilla uh, DMZ and then a production network. You can have different groups of applications that are actually walled off. And the VPCs allow you to have very explicit ingress and egress rules. So when you're going through that security design phase, you need to say, well, who really needs to communicate with this app? You might say, well, this is a web app, and all we really need to come into this VPC is port 443 and port 80 for internet traffic. And then you might say, well, we need to be able to access and manage these servers. Maybe we want to jump through a VPN tunnel. So we need to open up whatever port we need to use for our VPN here. And that's another route in. And then you could effectively kill everything else. That would be a very wise decision to make a design decision to make, you can implement that with the VPC and say nothing can come in or come out. But then once you're inside that VPC, you can go further with the security groups, which are almost like localized firewalls on every EC2 instance. Start thinking about how should those EC2 instances be able to talk to each other? So should this web app instance be able to talk to say this database server, sure, what port? Okay, this, you know, whatever port based on the, uh, the, the database you're using. Explicitly define that and block everything else. So it requires a lot of really good planning up front and a lot of really stringent configuration management. But this is really the best way to go to get that layered defense. So every, every step of the way, you're adding layers of rules and layers of design that minimize communications and minimize the ability of attackers and malware to really navigate and move within the environment. One good thing uh, that sometimes teams forget, especially me when I'm doing audits, security groups are stateful where VPCs are stateless. So what that means is that AWS security groups that you see on the EC2 instance, they allow everything uh, they allow nothing to come in by default, but they allow everything to go out by default. So teams may have to say, okay, we explicitly want to allow internet traffic into this EC2 instance, but by default, if you had a malicious uh, piece of malicious software, a misconfigured application, whatever, on that instance, it can dial out to anything at once. So once you get into that EC2 instance, theoretically an attacker could move anywhere out of it unless you explicitly configure that EC2 instance 
to not allow anything out as well, except those very necessary ports. The VPCs or that virtualized network I was talking about, they have access control lists. Those are stateless. So anything allowed to come in is not automatically, automatically allowed to come in. So it's the, it's the opposite situation. Just because you allowed something in, say again, that legitimate web uh, traffic, if you don't create a rule that it can head back out, if you had a legitimate user hitting a web app and you didn't configure a rule to say it can communicate back out, it's, it's going to be a broken app until you fix that. So that's something that can create headaches that I've seen uh, teams that are less familiar with AWS get frustrated and just open the floodgates. That's a huge mistake. You really need to be thoughtful about what you're allowing in and out of both your VPCs and your security groups. Another big one, to think about is AWS meta, uh, metadata services in EC2. So in EC2, there's a, a service that allows you to see basically all the, a lot of the configs on the machine. And this is, uh, this is vital to allowing you to effectively manage EC2 instances. The problem is that if a team happens to have sensitive information like security access keys stored on those instances, Attackers are regularly getting an instance, an EC2 instance, or they'll use something like a server-side request forgery attacks, which basically trick the uh, web service on the EC2 instance into thinking that the traffic is originating from inside that instance to cough up all the secrets. This is a really, really big deal. This is probably the second most common thing that we see companies fail at in pen tests. So this is another reason to restrict that traffic. Let's say that you have a web app with an uh, SSRF vulnerability on it, and an attacker is able to cough that back up. At least if you have the right rule, port rules in place, you might be able to prevent them from actually retrieving that, retrieving that information out, or even using it to, to siphon it out to another area of the, uh, the infrastructure. Um, another thing to think about as well, just a gotcha that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is you got to think about TSL termination a lot. That's definitely an engineering issue that I see happen from time to time that uh, is really outside the scope of this talk, but I just want to bring it up just in case anybody's feverishly taking notes to take back to their teams and make sure you Google that. And this is just a, a simple example of how you can stack all of these AWS elements to get defense in depth. Um, I had a good buddy that is in a real AWS engineer. And when he saw this, he beat it up. He's like, oh, you definitely wouldn't architect it that way. Except this, this graphic come from AWS. So, so that just goes to show no two people have the same take on AWS. But what you see here is, uh, these are AWS services. Um, I guess you guys can't see my mouse, but AWS has these services like the Web App Firewall, the, uh, the Route 53, which is uh, their DNS server, the storage, CloudFront, which is a, uh, a CDN or a content delivery network, et cetera. And you stack them together. And along the way, you can create different rules or, or features that will further refine what is allowed to pass through these gates, if you will. And it allows you different ways of interacting. And every time that you add a different feature, you got more security problems to, to solve. In this example, you see that S3 bucket up top. Um, you might have a static web host up there, and then CloudFront might be grabbing that, and you basically create a really quick quick uh, website that you just cough up to the end user mega fast. And then within that, maybe you have iframes and those iframes are tying back to something very technical on the back end or some kind of API calls on the back end. Well, developers might assume, oh, we have this S3 bucket. Everybody needs to have access to these, um, these web apps or, or these static websites. Well, that'd be wrong. CloudFront needs access to those static websites. So these, that's just a one example I've seen happen before where you really got to think every step of the way, what really needs access to what? Another gotcha too is don't assume that these services are configured right out of the box. The WAF is a great example. 
Amazon's web app firewall has tons of pre-configured rule sets, but you got to customize it to whatever you're using in your environment and you got to tailor it and, and build it to suit your needs. Cause out of the box, sure. It'll block a lot of junk, but it's probably not doing everything you need. So that's where that shared responsibility, you know, where it ends and where it begins is really important to be aware of. And then you'll notice how they're using a, an elastic load balancer in this illustration to split the infrastructure across uh, availability zones. That's, that could solve a, a bunch of other problems it's in itself as well and give you more availability, give you more security in different ways, create other security problems. I guess my point is that nothing is simple. Everything needs to be really thought through, think through how it ties together in the security requirements and no two teams do it the same way twice. So making sure S3 data is locked down. Uh, this is probably the number one issue that we see in pen tests. And if you look out in the industry of the big hacks, uh, S3 buckets are, are a big problem. By default, S3 is locked down. You got to open up access to it before it allow you to see anything. But for whatever reason, as you start putting things in S3, teams, you know, wires get crossed uh, across teams and permissions get harder to manage. Uh, you, and you've really just got to pay attention to how you're granting access. Another problem is S3 allows for multiple ways to manage access to it. So you can do it via IAM, you can do it via, uh, via access control list, um, and then there's a third way that escapes me at the moment. You need to basically come, come to a resolution on how you're going to manage IAM as a team and make sure that you're not unintentionally exposing it. This is where pen testing is mega helpful because those pen testers, that's the first thing, one of the first things they're gonna look at. They're gonna start scanning your S3 buckets, looking for things that are unintentionally exposed to the public internet. Another thing to be aware of, uh, when public access is needed, I hit it on this on the last side, you gotta think about the origin access identity, especially if you're tying it to a cloud front. Make sure that you're just really tying down those S3 permissions. I, I could beat this one into the ground. This is another one that could almost have a, a whole talk to itself. Another good tool I see teams using is AWS Macy. Macy will scan your buckets and look for a lot of security concerns, especially if you don't want things like PCI data or credit card data, social security numbers, other unique identifiers that might be considered very sensitive PII or PHI. I've seen a lot of teams start pointing AWS Macy at S3 and scanning them as another safeguard just to make sure people aren't committing sensitive data in the clear over there to uh, S3. And uh, finally, don't assume S3 is encrypted either. It's not encrypted by default. Don't assume communications in and out of S3 are encrypted by default. We mentioned earlier, logs are not encrypted by default either. And uh, finally, AWS has a ton of security tools, more all the time. It's hard to keep up with them all. These are the ones that I've seen heavily used to date. Uh, there's also a lot of great third party solutions, but don't over rely on them. And as I've mentioned over and over again, don't assume that they're configured right out of the so these all serve very different needs. Um, I think AWS guard duty is just a must have unless you've got um, a third party solution that you just think is bigger and better. Guard duty is so easy to turn on and it gives you a ton of value. Amazon WAF as well is very important, uh, especially since if you're dealing with certain compliance standards, it's a requirement. So it's an easy way to get compliant quick. But again, don't assume that it's configured right out of the gate. You may just stand it up and get compliant, but that doesn't mean you're secure. AWS Inspector is also another great one to stand up and it does configuration and uh, vulnerability scans. One big problem I've seen as companies move to containerized environments is that those hosts that are running the containers get locked into certain versions of Ubuntu or whatever they're using as their, their cluster host, and they never update them. 
Inspector will do a good job of finding those out of date versions or versions that have vulnerabilities and lighting up the security team to let them know that you need to patch. And that that's a big deal. That's one of the, the primary, another primary way that we see uh, in pen tests, these teams getting owned is out of patch systems. Um, AWS Shield is also a no brainer. It's basically you click a button and you get AWS Shield. That's DDO, a DDoS or distributed denial of service, uh, service that you can turn on. I believe that one is also required for some compliance requirements. So another way to get compliant as well. And then um, Detective, AWS Detective. I've not had an, an opportunity to use this yet, but I'm really interested to see how well it, it does it pulling together all of these different sources of data and allowing you to gain intelligence on it. So be on the lookout for that. It was new, just come out like in, in Q4 of last year. And uh, this was very topical. If you want to go deeper, you can just Google AWS Well Architected Framework. It's going to get in a lot to that IAM stuff I talked about in the VPC and uh, S3 stuff I talked about. It's also going to talk about how you set up multiple accounts and how you can tie together your accounts to get better segregation of duties like getting true segregation between your dev staging and uh, production environments, how you can pull policies together across all these different environments. It's, if you're a geek, you'll love it. If you're not a geek, it'll be dry, but really informative. And it's free on the Kindle app. So you can get it on your phone right now for free if you want to check it out. And I've got about 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna open up Slack and take a look. Let me know if anybody has any uh, questions here. And uh, feel free to, to help me out, Andy, if you saw anything come up that I missed. No, I am, uh, I'm good with everything. I mean, there's always a lot of content, right? You're the expert, that's why we brought you in. I'm just a lowly host today. <laughs> yeah so we yeah so uh we've had some good questions running in the slack uh channel i don't know i know you've been focused on giving your talk i don't know if you want to take a few minutes and address some of the comments that were dropped uh in the channel maybe yeah um i'm looking through um I saw Ochuan, or no, it wasn't Ochuan. Uh, Ethico InfoSec asked about a CASB solution, so Cloud Access Security Broker. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually don't know that I'm in a, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that one, if I'm being honest with you guys. I mean, if you Google, you can look at the Gardner Magic Quadrant, but most of the teams that I see, are using something like Okta and OneLogin to integrate with Active Directory or G Suite and just tie that in directly to their, their IAM. That's what the really good companies that are more mature are doing. And uh, I don't know if they're using any other, any other solutions beyond that. Uh, we had another question, uh, DevOps versus Sec DevOps. So this is something I missed, it was in my notes but I miss bringing up. One of the challenges with moving to the cloud is we have a lot of um, IT guys that are having to move to the cloud and maybe there's a, a, a gap in the skill set because the cloud is really geared towards developers more. And it's really been taken over by this philosophy called DevOps, which blends together development and operations for better or for worse, for better because it allows you a lot more agility, but worse because you lose a lot of the segregation that traditional IT had. So a developer in IT were siloed to a point where one could not adversely affect the other. And you, you could allow IT to really just focus on doing what they do best. Well, now you've had teams pulled in a direction where there's a lot of shared responsibility. DevSecOps, is meant to address some of those challenges and find ways to integrate security into the DevOps lifecycle. And a lot of that would be things I mentioned in this, uh, this presentation, really insisting on, as you go through the whole process of 
delivering an application and then managing it through its life cycle, finding places to plug security into it along the way. So that, that's a pretty good question as well. Do you see any, anything prior? Uh, Mike C asked, is virtual, oh, Mike C just said virtual patching is definitely worth the effort. Yes, you are absolutely right. Paul mentioned Amazon WAFs block a lot of activity by default. Yeah, one, companies get a false sense of security because you hire a pen tester, they hit your WAF, and the WAF does a great job at killing pen testers because that's what it's made to do. Because the pen testers are use something like Burp Suite just to like pommel the WAF, and the WAF's just like, no way, bro. We saw all this coming a mile away. Well, uh, a WAF doesn't stop very, very clever guys that actually know how to programmatically attack web apps as in not hit a fuzzer or not hit some automated tool that just sprays it, but guys that are like surgeons and find issues. So you got to actually go on the WAF and figure out exactly, it's a least privilege problem all over again. You got to figure out what is the expected behavior of this web app? What functions and calls should be happening? And tune your WAF to allow those and block everything else. That really takes a specialized uh, security expert to do it. It, it, takes a, it takes almost a developer that has decided they really love security and then they cross over into it. So tuning a WAF is actually a really hard job. It's like tuning a SIM, same kind of situation. Or a, a SIM being a, a security logging utility. Sorry, I don't want to assume everybody knows what these acronyms mean. Uh, do you guys okay. see any others or we need to cut it off, Andy? Yeah, we're right. We're right up against it here. Uh, we've got maybe time for one more brief question so that uh, we can keep running on schedule. You got and one for me. A, <laughs> um, so yeah, honestly, this is the first time we've done this today, and you are the first speaker in the track. Uh, how did it? How did it work for you? I thought that I wasn't going to be nervous because I do this with clients all the time, and then I got on here and I just totally choked on my tongue. <laughs> I was like, why am I nervous? I'm sitting in my office by myself in shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, not, not for nothing, but we, you know, we, at, at our high count here, the last time I'm, I'm keeping a periodic eye on the number of participants and uh, we're at 131 last time, the high number hey, I saw. So awesome. you know, there you go. Yeah. So um, that's, that's the high water mark. For, uh, for everybody to be. So I know Wes Lambert is queued up and, and on the panel and ready to go next. Um, so I'll, Wes, I'll, that's, that's your, that's your uh, high mark. You got to beat that, man. Yeah, right. and I'll, I'll uh, dump my slides into the appropriate channel in Slack. And, Excellent. Uh, thank you, guys. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Shane, thank you so much for everything.